Praise God. Like I said, I'm bringing to you a very short series which I titled War. War. Somebody say war. <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> this is serious. War. Uh, for those of you who were in here last week, please listen to the um, message that, um, that last week's message because this is more of a continuum. Praise God. Praise God. War. War. Friends, I'd like to announce to you that whether you like it or not, as a child of God, you are engaged in one form of war or another. And last week, I did say to you that we brought a message titled, Be Careful of the war that you're not fighting. I know that many times what we have been preached to us is Jesus died, he won the victory, and we are more than conqueror, therefore we should ease ourselves. Without remembering that the Bible says in Amos chapter 6, it says, I think there's one, two of it, it says, woe to him. That's it, that, that is at ease in Zion. I want to let you know that it doesn't matter how much of peace you want, you cannot, and in the world we live today, peace is always a product of a period of war. There's always a contention before peace when Jesus says peace I live with you my peace I give to you is not talking about there will be no trials tribulations circumstances contentions the Bible says Jesus when he was speaking he said in this world you will have what tribulation I know that many of us are used to the song, I will never suffer because Jesus suffered for me. Lie. In this world, you will have tribulations. He says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome. Friends, whether you want to be enlisted or not, Everybody who is called by the name of God is by default enlisted in the army. Just like the children of Israel, and just like even, even in today's uh, um, Israel, as long as you get to a particular stage in life, a particular age in life, you are by default enlisted. Some other countries have some form of paramilitary approach to it, such that when you get to a certain stage, you are enlisted. Some, when you pass through a certain degree, you are enlisted into some paramilitary institution. In the kingdom of God, by default, by you ascribing to the sovereignty of God and giving your life to Jesus, you are by default enlisted. Hence, I want to announce to you, welcome to war. We are all in a fight. We are all in a contention. And I don't want us to miss that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> because many of us think that life should just go rosy. I was saying to someone the other day, she said, I'm just tired of the whole thing. I said, it is because you're running it in your own strength. 
God never promised that these kind of things will not happen. But you need to understand how you engage it and overcome it. The problem is not what happens to us. The problem is our responses to these things. When I say war, I know in our mindsets what we have is some, someone with ammunition, missiles, you know, and you know, nuclear ammunition and stuff like that to destroy nations. In as much as that sounds true in a natural sense, but friends, the kind of war we are engaged in is totally different. But the same purpose of that war War never brings anything but destruction. And whoever is destroyed surrenders. And power begins to, you know, basically the purpose of war is to impose power. Is to overcome. Amen. Let's get into scripture. And today I want to share something which is critical. Last week, I said to you there are three things that the Spirit, that God specifically in the scripture tells us we can fight for. You fight for your faith. You fight for your family. And you fight for the kingdom. Now, if you, and in the next three weeks, I will touch on these three. But today, we're going to look at the earnest fight for our faith. Or the earnest fight for your faith. The earnest fight for your faith. Jude chapter 3. Jude chapter 3. I will try and do this in a very short period of time. Let's see how God will help us. Jude chapter 3, uh, sorry, Jude verse 3 rather, <laughs> there is no chapter. Jude is the youngest brother of Jesus Christ, okay? And when you see the word Jude, is the Greek pronunciation of the Greek version of Judah, okay? When you see James, is the Greek version of Jacob. Okay, when you see things like Joseph, that's Joseph. Okay, Jesus had four brothers recorded. James, who is the main, the older. You have uh, uh, um, Joseph, you have Simon, and you have um, Jude, Judas. Um, so he wrote this. He wrote this. Just want to give you a context, a historical context of it. So this person is someone who is, has grown up with Jesus Christ. He grew up with Jesus. He, he understood the terrain and the dynamics from which he was writing from. But he wrote a very small letter. He wanted to write a big letter, but he wrote a very small letter. Look at verse 3 of it. Jude verse 3 and 4. Just verse 3. It says, Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in on notice who long ago we are marked out for this condemnation on godly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord and our the only Lord God, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I read that in the message version. See that in the message version. It says, Dear friends, I dropped everything to write about this life of salvation that we have in common. I've dropped everything. It says, I have to write insisting, begging, 
that you fight with everything you have in you. For this faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and cherish. To guard and cherish. What has happened is that some men have infiltrated our ranks. Our scriptures warns us this would happen. Who beneath their pious skin are shameless scoundrels. Their design is to replace the sheer grace of God with sheer license, which means doing away with Jesus Christ, our own, our, our, our one and only master. When he says doing away with Jesus Christ, he's not saying completely denying Jesus Christ. No, what he's saying is what denying and excusing the teachings of Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. But you now explain away the commandments of Jesus Christ. Under the guise of grace. Hallelujah. Let me read this. Revelations chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12. It says... And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was there any place, neither was there was there place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast down, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. The message version says, who led the whole earth astray? We deceived the whole world. He was cast out into earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and this power. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Which caused them, which accused, accused them before our God when day and night. Underline that. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heaven and ye, and, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil is come down unto you. Having great wrath. Because he knows that he had but a short time. He knows that his time is short. Praise God. The Bible says there was war in heaven. Endlessly contend. <laughs> Friends, we are not talking about fall down and die here. Neither are we talking about any form of rascality that we find in the Christian body today. We're talking about the very essence of our faith. And the need to what? To fight for it. Friends, it took a fight to bring about the faith we proclaim. The only thing that can keep it to whoever it has been assigned to, to me, for me and for you, it will take a fight. Not the kind of fight you're thinking, but the kind of fight the scripture prescribes. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says that the enemy has come down he didn't win the war on, in heaven, and so he's at it on earth. 
and day and night he accuses us brethren before God. I want to let you know that that word accuse is a legal word. Okay? It's a legal word. So let us not have the mindset. You know, sometimes we carry our world mindset, the diabolic mindset we have while we were in the world, we bring it into the kingdom and we think that's how the kingdom operates. Have you ever seen people, blah, blah, shay, oh God, hey, it doesn't make any difference. Are you getting what I'm saying? He has made us kings and priests. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you ever seen a king who will, because he wants something to happen, he begins to say, oh, oh, he, he, and start shaking his body. No, the king will just give an order. He gives a command and things happen. Hallelujah. The Bible says Jesus spoke as one with what? Authority. The Bible talks about the disciples. It says, when they spoke, they knew, they took notice that these ones have been with Jesus. Friends, I want to say to you that the only fight the devil has against your faith is to accuse you is simply to accuse us to a point that our faith is undermined that's all that is the fight friends he couldn't handle it with God he was cast down to earth and then immediately salvation was released down to earth. But this guy will accuse. He will accuse you. Let me say to you that when he accuses you, he doesn't accuse you all of the time. No. He doesn't have the time to accuse you all of the time. The Bible says what? Day and night. He accuses. That's very key and very significant. I'm going somewhere with this. Because by the time we finish today, you will know where your fight is. And you will go and fight your fight. Because friends, your issue is not any other person. Nobody. The Bible says God is on my side. What can man do to me? Nobody can do anything to you except you permit it. Nobody. It is impossible. Let them be a billion. One with God is majority. Are you getting the point? I'm taking it slowly. I'm trying to take it slowly. There is a fight, friends. And the enemy accuses us. See, that word accuse, I want to touch on it quickly. That word accuse, or rather, before I even touch on that, if there is one thing that establishes our faith, it's not that we come to church. No. If there is one thing that establishes our faith, it's not that we practice certain religious dogma. If there is one thing that establishes our faith, is our relationship with God. Christianity, I say, is not a religion. It's a relationship with the Father. Void of any pretense. Through the paid prize of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is Christianity. He brings us into a relationship of father-son relationship. 
like I said to you, in God there is no concept of daughter. <laughs> uh, amen. There's no concept of daughter. You know why? Otherwise, you're not a claim to inheritance. Most world cultures deny the women. Are you getting what I'm saying? They deny the women of certain rights and inheritance. But to God, we are all sons. I know these days they try to, you know, make it, you know, more, make the Bible more relevant so they put sons and daughters. No. When you go to the original scripture, it says sons. Are you getting the point? Because we are all sons of God. Why? Sons have got heritage. They've got inheritance. So God does not see you. There's neither male nor female. That's what the Bible says. There is neither what? Male nor female. Anyway, that's not the point for today. What am I saying here? Is our relationship with God. That is the basis of our faith. Our intimacy with God. That is the basis of our, of our faith. Our one-on-one -on -one connection with God is the basis of any faith that you claim to have. I went to preach somewhere one day and I said it to them. The fact that your name is James does not make you a Christian. I lost everybody. The pastor got upset. The fact that you come to church does not make you a Christian. No. Your relationship with God is what makes you one. The Bible says when they saw them in Antioch, they called them Christians. Is the behavior the mixed one? Is the relationship? But how many of us know that that is one of the hardest things to manage in our today's world? The daily intimacy with the Father has become one of the most undermined things. In our Christian faith. We have. Every, we can prioritize everything. Over and above. Our one on one relationship. Why? The enemy. Is accusing. I will show you how. I will go into scriptures and I'll show you how. Because the daily sacrifice that God has enacted is what keeps the covenant going. Is what keeps the covenant going. Morning and evening. You see Joshua verse 1, chapter 1 verse 8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it. When? Day and night. <laughs> Day and night. And then be careful to do. Why? Is talking about the morning and the evening sacrifice. But the devil will make sure he accuses you in those period to ensure that that is cast away. Let's get into, let me get into my notes. Hence, the main thing about our faith that the enemy is warring against is simply our fellowship with God. Our intimacy with God. Friends, there is nobody who is intimate with God who can ever lose on any account. Who 
can ever lose on any account. See two couples who are intimate with themselves on a daily basis. It is impossible for there to be a discussion of divorce. If the devil can capture that intimate time, he's good. That is the only contention that you have. As, come, as long as it, as far as it comes to your faith, because you see, every other thing as touching your faith, church going, um, church activities, fasting, praying, giving, service, evangelism, and all those kind of things hang on the balance of your intimacy with God. And if it can take off the balance, the rest is just simple. The rest is simple. What does it mean for the enemy to accuse us? What does it mean? The word accuser is from the Greek word kategoros. Kategoros. Meaning one who stand against another in the assembly. Or a complainant at law. We have a church full of lawyers in the house. So I'm always careful whenever I say anything regarding the law because I've got to check my research very well. It means a plaintiff. Someone who brings a case against you. And it brings that case against you day and night. You know how he does it? Four ways. Number one, condemnation. He makes you feel that I'm too condemned to bring myself before the Lord. And that is why James says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly. Come boldly. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, There is therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. So you are no longer condemned. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are free. Come. But he will accuse you. You are coming here to pray now. You that told a lie the other day. Look at it. You are coming here. That is one thing David understood. It doesn't matter who I am, where I am, or what I've done. If I fall before God, I know he will have mercy. He understood the throne of mercy. Condemnation. <laughs> condemnation. You feel so condemned that you cannot go before God. He's accused you. Accuse. Secondly, how does he do this? Doubt. Doubt. You come, you ask God for something. Double mindedness. The Bible talks about what? If we lack wisdom, let us ask from him who gives freely. But when we ask, we should not ask in doubt. For a double-minded person cannot receive anything from God. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing James chapter 1. Are you getting it? He cannot obtain anything from God. So he sends doubt into your heart. Are you sure? How did he win the war in the garden? He just asked a question that threw doubt. just asked a question that made the person, made Eve doubted God's word. That's all. It just gets you to doubt. That's it. God said to you, I will provide. I am your provider. <laughs> I don't know. The next thing, we see our account, 
he suggests that, he suggests this, and what happens? Doubt. Can you see that it's not fist fight? <laughs> The Bible says the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is stronghold? Mindset. It's not one big thing. You know, sometimes we think about shrine in Africa. No, 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 no. That is not it. It's just mindset. Pull down that mindset. Put in the mindset of Christ and you will reign for life. Pulling down strongholds. Casting down image imaginations reasonings reasonings so he sends doubt he sends doubt James chapter I mean first second Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 listen to it he says I desire that every that I desire therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting without wrath or doubting it leads me to the next one the next thing the enemy uses is what offense <laughs> uh, offense Friends, things can happen to you that you will in turn turn around and blame God for it. Has that happened to you before? If it has not happened to you before, then maybe you've not tasted a bit of life yet. Amen. There was an exam I wrote one time. Those were the days when I thought after you pray, you have to pray at least 30 days for God to hear you. The, 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 the intensity of your prayer and the, how, the length of your prayer determines how much God hears you. Nonsense. Please take the tapes I preached a few years ago, a few, or was it last year or two years ago. The principle, the kingdom principle on prayer. There's not how long or how short it is the level of intimacy. Sometimes I can be with the Lord two hours, three hours. Sometimes it's five minutes, ten minutes. It's the intimacy. Are you getting the point? Once that intimacy is established, time becomes no issue. Because you're operating in a level of love. Offense. Here was I after praying 30 days. Trust God, I wrote this exam. And then I fasted 30 days. <laughs> and then I went to collect my results. It was the worst result I ever had in my life. And then I said to myself, there is indeed no God. When I learned things, things more, and I understood these things in the years after somebody came to me with similar thing and I said me too I don't like your God your God is wicked you know why your God wants us to fast 30 days but I understood he says if you who are evil can give good gifts how much more me your heavenly father and that was when I decided there was no God until God arrested me and put me back in shape and made me realize that I was only a product of, that was only a product of my stupidity and my ignorance. Hallelujah. The Bible says in John chapter 6, it says, And many no longer went with him again. From verse 16. Many did not go with him anymore because they said, This one, this saying is too hard. And Jesus looked at them and said, Are you offended in me? Friends, if people have not started getting offended in you for taking a stand in God, go and check it. It is impossible for you to take a stand in Jesus and you don't have an opposition. You will. It will raise it up. 
And it will be then your choice whether you want to sit down or you want to still take the stand. Because I tell you, fear is nothing. Somebody defined fear. I can't remember how somebody defined fear. He says fear is, uh, is, is um, false, fa false what? Appearing real. False evidence appearing real. It's so brilliant. Stand, the Bible says. They will go. Amen. Listen to me. Don't be afraid of any adversary. Any adversary that leaves you, don't worry. You've overcome. The higher you go, the more adversary you meet. So he brings offense. Offense. And then Jesus asked Peter, P Peter and the disciples, he asked the 12, he said, are you also going to leave? Offense. The Bible says offense will come. But woe is he. There's a curse on whoever is taken by offense. That is why I ever tell people, I always tell people and advise people, go and check. Anybody who leaves a church out of offense has got an issue. You don't leave. You don't leave a relationship out of offense. Not even church. Don't leave a relationship out of offense. Repair it and move on. If you are going to move, let it be by God. Let offense not be the one. The Bible says, for, for, they that are led by offense, they are the sons of God. Is that so? No. They that are led by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. So these are how the devil does. So you're so pure from where God has obtained you and appointed you. Hence, you're no longer where God needs you to be. And you still want the blessing of God. No. God does not pay for what he doesn't provide. I mean, I, 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 um, he, he doesn't sign for. That is why he will call Abraham. He will say to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, take your only son. But he had two sons. Why? They, Ishmael was not God's subscribe. God, God did not request or did, did, did not order for Ishmael. Amen. Let's get on with this. And the next thing he does is what? He uses his fear. You see, one evidence of offense, please notice this, please. The beginning of offense is complaint. The moment you start to complain about issues around, know that offense is just lacking in the corner, waiting to pounce. The last one is fear he uses. The enemy uses fear. I hope I can finish this today, but I'll try. I'll just wrap it up somehow. Fear. Fear. Have you people been afraid to be late for work. Ah, I'm afraid of. We quickly, do you know, have you noticed that the moment crisis comes, the first thing that goes out of the window is prayer. Our time of prayer. The moment issues come or we have pressing uh, uh, schedules, our schedules are pressing, the first thing that goes out is prayer. If it's finances, the first thing that goes out is what? Oh, <laughs> free and tight. Are you getting the point? What is he doing? He is bringing accusation. Making you feel that you don't have to do it anyway. Undermining everything you do. Bringing a case against you. In your heart, you will know but you know what? He will help you to justify it. God understands. My work schedule is busy. God's on, God understands. Are you getting the point? And you know what? The system of this world will make sure your intimacy with God is undermined. 
this system of this world does not and has not recognized and will not recognize and will not cater for your intimacy with God. Hence, you will have to fight for that position. Hallelujah. You will have to fight for that position. And that is why Paul, Paul said to Peter, uh, Paul said to Timothy, he said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but out of love first. Power. Sound mind. Self-control, that's what it means. Love. Power. Sound mind. That means the power is yours. If you love him, the power is yours to do according as you wish. But he will so undermine your faith. Help you believe how worthless you are. Help you believe that if you don't help yourself, God cannot help you. Help you believe that yes, at least God understands. And the, slowly you find out the power begins to leave you. The authority. Can you see that the church of, the church of Christ, the body of Christ today lacks that power? Because the pastors we even have cannot spend more than maximum 15 minutes praying. And then they come to the pulpit. What do you have to give them? One day I will preach. By the way, we still have that kingdom series going. I will touch on the kingdom principles, or rather the kingdom order of the church. I hope they will not chase me out of Manchester. Because I will address things. Friends. There are those who minister to God. While well, there are those who minister to the people. You need to pick the kind of ministers you're getting. Are they the ones who minister to God and then minister to people? Those are the, those are, those are the priests. Those are, those are the priests from the family of Zadok. The rest are just jokers. The Bible says he will allow them to continue to minister to the people, but he will, they will never minister to him. <laughs> there are two kinds of ministers one that ministers to God another one that ministers to people people minister we we'll touch on some others but that's not the subject for today but we are at war somebody say war hallelujah I know some of these messages are not the type that we scream about but um, I hope that it's giving us light but he accuses us day and night. Why? Because our relationship with God is a daily affair. Is a daily affair. And that is why in, and that is why in, 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 the, in, in the book of Exodus, God established the daily sacrifice. In, 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 in Leviticus, I think chapter 6, verse 13, it says, The oil shall continue to burn on the altar. It shall not be put out. How many of us have put out our altars? Our daily altar. How many, how, how is your intimacy with God? You know, many says, oh, I love God. You know, it's easy to say I love God. I was saying to somebody yesterday, I said, look, love is not thought. Love is expressed. You don't say, you know, the reason why we are finding life difficult is because we want to live according to the ordinance of the world. I love you, baby. No, show me you love me. Don't tell me. Are you getting the point? Show me, don't tell me. For God so loved the world that he said, no. For God so loved the world that he gave. The Bible says, for herein is love, that as Jesus lay his life down, we also lay our life down. That is love. Love doesn't say, love does. Are you getting the point? So if we love God, where is our intimacy with God? When was the last time we spent some time just worshipping him? Just staying in his place. Just studying his word. Thank God that God has helped us in our midst today. We have the six months Bible reading exercise that we are running. But is it okay we can turn that time into a quality time 
before him. The Bible talks about day and night. Your success in life is determined by you studying the word day and night according to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Day and night. Day and night. Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, verse, 20, verse 23, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. How? Daily. Daily. Because the enemy is at war with you day and night. He will make sure you have all the time in the world. But you see that 10 minutes, 15 minutes you keep for God in the morning. That 10 minutes, 15 minutes you keep for God in the evening. You will never, he will tire you out. He will give you something better in your own view and in the view of the world to do. Because you will never, he will make sure access to power is cut off. It's time for us to also go behind the enemy lines. Because for a long time the enemy is going behind our own lines. Let me show you what I mean. Daniel chapter 8. I will try. Please give me a bit of five minutes. Because it's like this message is going a bit far, far longer than I expected. But anyway. Daniel chapter 8. Let me show you that and then show you what the daily sacrifice is. In fact, before that, let's see what the daily sacrifice is about. Exodus chapter 29. From verse 38, it says, Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lamb of the first year, day by day continually. One lamb shall be off, which you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. That's in the evening. That's what it means. With one lamb you shall offer one tenth of, let, let's, let's skip that. Let, now let's go to verse, verse 42. Let's just skip that because of time. Verse 42, he says, This shall be a continual bond offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord where I will meet to speak with you. Imagine you daily receiving instruction from God. Who is he that can stand against you? He says, and I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. What tabernacle? This tabernacle. We are the temple of the Lord. We are the tabernacle of the Lord in which the Lord dwells, in whom the Lord dwells. Look at it. says, so I will consecrate the tabernacle of the meeting at the altar. And I will consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. His sons to minister to me as priests. It means that the moment you begin to establish that daily principle, God will begin to access your home and your children will also be ministers to him. Why? Because Revelation chapter 5 says what? It says, for he has made us kings and priests and we will reign on the earth. How do we reign? By first and foremost overcoming the enemy. How? By the daily sacrifice. I will show you what the enemy has done with the daily sacrifice. Daniel chapter, cha chapter 8. I'll just read that one quickly. Daniel chapter 8. From verse 9. Daniel chapter 8 verse 9. He says now, And out of them came a little horn. This was, this was a vision that Daniel saw. Okay? About the end time. And out of them came a little horn which grew exceeding great towards the south. Towards the earth and all that. Let's keep all of that. Let's go straight into verse... Um, Verse 11 is talking about this uh, uh, um, goat, so to speak. The Bible says in verse 11, He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts. Who exalted himself in the scripture? The devil. 
and by him the daily sacrifices were cast away, were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. When you see the H, the his sanctuary there is capital H. The place of the sanctuary of God was cast down. The daily sacrifice was made away with. Because of the transgressions, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice. So don't think the enemy is joking. He's released the army to fight against you and ensure you don't observe your daily sacrifice. And he cast down, and he cast, and he cast truth down to the ground. He cast what down to the ground? Truth. Truth. He cast truth down to the ground. He did all these and prospered. <laughs> Can you see what is happening with our daily sacrifice? It has been prophesied a long time ago. This will happen. That is why the Bible says, well, take heed. Why? Because the very elect will be casted away if they are not careful. The Bible talks about the great falling away. Of the very elect because by the time you become too familiar with God you think that it is just normal God really does not need the daily sacrifice no God does not need it but you need it you need access to power you need access to authority you need access to prosperity Look at, look at, look at ele chapter 11 of that same Daniel, verse 31. It says, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice, and the place, and place their abomination of desolation. What contains desolation? Depression, issues, problem, crisis. Sometimes our crisis is a product of we not fighting for the daily sacrifice. It says those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery. Flatter you. But the people who know their God shall be strong and shall carry out great exploits. The people who know their God the people who know their God. How do they know their God? Because they know their God by daily engaging in the daily sacrifice. Engaging in daily sacrifice. Friends, I want to employ you to ask ourselves today, where are we with reference to the daily sacrifice? Where are we with reference to the daily sacrifice? How do we overcome this? The Bible says we overcome him. The revelations that we read earlier, verse 11 of it. We overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Where do we get that word from? From the daily sacrifice. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall what? Meditate therein when? Day and night. Daily sacrifice of the word, friends. Daily sacrifice. Day by day, engage yourself. And I want to announce to you that by the time you begin to engage yourself, you'll be winning the war. Because you know what? You'll be kindling a fire. You'll be kindling a fire. Kindling a fire that even the devil cannot touch. You will become so untouchable Amen. People will see you and they will take notice that this one has been with Jesus. They will understand. The devil will have your registered address. Listen, the devil said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Why? Because they are registered. They know that this one's had a great daily sacrifice. Jesus will say, a great while before day. Many of us, you find even ministers who they are too busy to pray. They are too busy to pray. They are too busy. Hallelujah. Are you too busy to pray? 
Are you too busy to take a scripture a day and just spend time in the word of God and say, God, what do you have for me today? Are you too busy? Are you too concerned about life that you have even forgotten to take it to the Lord in prayer? Where is our daily sacrifice? Where is our daily sacrifice? Every day that your case, the, the devil is bringing a case against you every day. How much have you defended it? How much have you defended it? The devil accused Jesus when he tempted him. The only thing Jesus had for him is the word of God. Anytime the devil quotes the scripture, he has a word for him. What word have you got for the enemy? How do you defend yourself? How do you war this war? Friends, it's time to come back to the daily sacrifice. Shall we rise to our faith?